sport has been applied to many cars that are not all that sporty. The sport in question is racing. The difference being sports cars are intended as street cars, or in most cases as dual purpose cars, meaning road and track. Nothing unnecessary and room only for the driver and possibly a ride along mechanic and or navigator, hence the two-seater. In other words, everything an SUV is not, or perhaps nothing an SUV is. Either way, as usual, it has been interpreted in a number of ways by different companies at different times. In the early days, it typically meant runabouts or stripped-down speedsters, cars like the Mercer Type 35 Raceabout, introduced in 1910 with a 4.8-liter inline 4, pushing 55 horsepower and a top speed of 90 miles an hour, guaranteed to be able to maintain 70 miles an hour on public roads a real feat for its time, and available until 1914. And there was the Marmon Model 32 of 1911, which would be the basis on which the Marmon Wasp was built, the car that won the first Indianapolis 500. And Marmon would offer up to 16-cylinder engines before being killed off by the Great Depression. Stutz introduced the Bearcat in 1912, lasting until 1916 in its original form and Stutz continued to offer it in various forms off and on until the dual-valve Super Bearcat of the 1930s. Bugatti was another early manufacturer, starting in 1909, hitting their peak in the 1930s, and surviving into the late 1950s. But the Great Depression all but killed off the sports car market, with a few classic names surviving, such as Alpha and Talbot, although that didn't stop burgeoning hot rodders from making their own. So the post-war era was ripe for a sports car revival, with room for brands like Porsche and Ferrari to carve out a niche. But the car that would revive the sports car market in the U.S. would be the MGTC, the Miata of its day. And soon everybody wanted a piece of the market. With independent American manufacturers ranging from the tiny Crosley Hotshot to the relatively huge Curtis Craft Sport, Nash teamed up with Healy to create the Nash Healy. Kaiser produced the Darren with its slick hidden sliding doors. Cunningham used a Chrysler Hemi with a Pininfarina body shared with Ferrari to create the C3. And there were a number of cars that were little more than kits, like the Bocar XP5. But in fact, most manufacturers toyed with the idea of one kind of sports car or another at least once. Chevrolet introduced the Corvette in 1953 as a rather mundane six-cylinder roadster that would quickly grow into a V8-powered American icon. Ford introduced the two-seat Thunderbird in 1955, but insisted it was a personal coupe and not a sports car. Pontiac made the small mid-engine Fiero from 1984 to 1988. Oldsmobile never got past the prototype stage, but they tried it a couple of times. Cadillac attempted to create a Mercedes SL competitor with the Elante from 1987 to 1993. Buick made a luxury sports car based on the Riviera from 1988 to 1991 called the Rietta. Chrysler teamed up with Maserati for the Chrysler TC Coupe by Maserati. Mercury offered a Miata competitor with the 91 to 93 Capri, and Dodge took things to a whole other level with the semi-retro V10-powered Viper in the 90s. And Plymouth did the retro hot rod Prowler as sort of a last hurrah before they disappeared in 2000. Then you have the boutique manufacturers, bringing you everything from the Bricklin SV1 to the Peno's Esperante to the Celine S7 to the Val Mangusta. And let's not forget those hybrids. No, not gas-electric hybrids, although there have been some of those too, but European cars with American engines. Some of the best known being the Jensen Interceptor, the De Tomaso Pantera, the Fossil Vega FBS and HK500, and of course, the legendary Shelby Cobra. Because for most people, sports cars are associated with European brands. Ferrari started producing their own cars in 1947, Porsche made its debut in 1948 with the 356 that carried on until 1965. Swallow Sidecar became Jaguar 
and introduced the far more exotic XK120 of 1948 to 1954, soon to be followed by the gull-winged Mercedes 300 SL, introduced in 1954. Lamborghini was a bit later to enter the segment, focusing more on GTs, but it was hard to ignore them once they did. And in fact, the list of traditional sports cars gets quite long, ranging from things like the Austin Healey 3000 to any number of Triumph TRs, from the relatively mundane Fiat Spider to the much more exotic Lancia Stratos, the stylish but slow Carmen Ghia, to the more impressive but rarer Alpine A110, and from the overly simple Lotus 7 to the much more complicated Maserati Merrick. BMW had early sports cars, but perhaps none of them would be as famous as the M1, and let's not forget the Opel GT, and the baby Ferrari, the Dino 246 GT, or the Swedish cars, Volvo's P1800, and the Saab Sonnet, or Sonnets and even more boutique offerings, ranging from TVR to the super retro Morgans like the Plus 8. And the list goes on. McLaren, Pagani, Koenigsegg, and so on. And that isn't even looking at the so-called vaporware offerings. And even the Japanese have gotten in on it, with early roadsters like the Datsun Fairlady and the Honda S600, to early coupes like the Toyota 2000 GT, the Datsun 240Z, and the Mazda RX-7. But most sports car offerings have tended to come and go quite quickly. A variation of the Opel GT came to the U.S. for a second time, from 2004 to 2010, as both the Saturn Sky and the Pontiac Solstice. Cadillac got its own version of the Corvette as the XLR from 2004 to 2009, while Chrysler got a variant of the Mercedes SLK as the Crossfire from 2004 to 2008. Honda had the S2000 Roadster from 99 to 2009, and the NSX was sold here as an Acura starting in 1990. Toyota offered the mid-engined MR2 for three generations starting in 1984, and a car reviving the Super name has recently appeared in the segment as part of a joint venture with BMW. Today, the Corvette is in its 8th generation and still going strong. Ford is still offering a 2nd generation GT, inspired by the legendary GT40. But 5 generations of Dodge Viper ended in 2017. Mazda has taken over the affordable sports car market with the MX-5 Miata, going all the way back to 1989, as Triumph, Austin, and MG are little more than a memory. The new Honda Acura NSX is in its last year, but sports cars are still typically considered European, with exotic Italians like the Lamborghini Huracan. It's hard to believe that the Ferrari F8 descended from the once separate Dino line of sports cars, while the high-end two-seat Ferrari 812 Superfast is now often referred to as a GT. And the revived Bugatti? Well, it's a thing. Alfa Romeo's 4C didn't make it past 2020, and Fiat's 124 Spider is now based on the Mazda Miata. Porsche has the Cayman and its topless Boxster counterpart. Mercedes killed off the SLK last year, but there is still an SL. The current Z4 has been around since 2018 and shares its platform with the Toyota. And Audi offers both the high-end, almost a Lamborghini R8, and the smaller front-wheel drive Trophy Touring, or TT. Surprisingly or not, Morgan is still going, and they keep insisting that Lotus is too. Not a lot of current options, but for a supposedly dead segment, it is practically flourishing compared to the so-called popular segments. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment below and like and subscribe. Thank <laughs> you.